So I want to talk a little bit about the Vellum Solver and, you know, some of the settings you're going to need to be messing around with in this. And, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. John Lynch, one of the engineers at Side Effects, did a really great video uh, with like examples and, you know, really goes into detail about what's happening under the hood uh, that makes this all work. And it's, I really recommend watching that. Um, but just to do a quick overview of the things you'll need to, to mess about with. It's the sub steps, obviously, um, you know, this is pretty self-explanatory. Sub step to two, that means, you know, each frame will be broken two pieces. And for each sub step, this is where it gets interesting. It'll run 25 constraint iterations. So constraint iterations are things like uh, bend and stretch resistance. And then interleaved with those constraint iterations is the collision passes. So in this case, it's going to, for each sub step, it's going to run 25 constraint iterations. And it's going to run those as five constraints, one collision, another five constraints, another collision. And so it, it'll go back and forth and, you know, until it gets to the next sub step. And so, you know, if you start increasing the sub steps, you're going to be multiplying all those things quite a bit. And the thing I really want to point out here that I don't know if John goes over in the video is um, this is something that will happen pretty often if you have like kind of more dense geometry is you get these situations where it's stretching like crazy. And, you know, that that's not what I want to happen. I've already got the stiffness at 1 to the 10th power, which is, I don't know, like 10 billion or something. And you're going to sit here and be like, oh, man, I'm just going to keep adding more numbers until this starts working. And then, you know, you hit play again, and it's still, you know, just not really doing what you want to do. Um, and the reason for that is, is the cloth actually isn't uh, converging on a solution because you're not giving it enough constraint iterations. So when you see, like, crazy stretching like that, and you're like, no, I've got the stretch resistance way high, what you want to look for is just start increasing those constraint iterations. And so now you're going to get a, uh, that's a much more reasonable solution. It's not stretching. It's, you know, doing what I expect it to do. So, I mean, constraint iterations, like if I set this to 2000, I'm going to get a very similar result. As you can see, it's a pretty similar result. And the reason for that is, is uh, Vellum is a extended position-based dynamic uh, solver. And so what that means is the constraint iterations aren't going to change the look of the cloth um, too much. I mean, it's, it's, it'll be different, but it's going to be very similar. And uh, the caveat to that is, is that if the constraint iterations are so low that it's unable to converge on a solution, then, you know, that's that's not going to work. So just make sure you have enough constraints uh, iterations in there. And for sub steps, I wouldn't put these any higher than say five. Um, even with fast movement, the uh, solver is pretty robust. And you know, when you start cranking this number up too high, it, it really bogs down the simulation. You can even get away with three or four. Um, so anyways, that's the solver setup. And now I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the cloth settings and how to find good settings. Most of this is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. This is stuff you've seen in other solvers like stretch, bend, plasticity, that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the slightly different things is uh, you can, the mass is per point. So this is kind of an extreme example, but you know, if you have topology where it's more dense in some places than others, if you have this uh, mass set to uniform, then it's going to put uniform values on each point. And so that left-hand side of this is going to be way too heavy. Uh, so what you want to do is set that to calculate varying and it'll adjust based on surface area um, what the density should be. So now if we uh, visualize this for, whoops, visualize mass, we can see it's weighting those larger polygons. Uh, those points are heavier than these smaller ones. So that's just kind of like a little thing to keep in mind. 
And also another kind of interesting feature is like in this situation, um, let's see, well, by default, the rest angle scale is going to be at 0.5. And so, uh, basically the, the bend angles will try to hold what they're, um, actually is this 0.5 or is this, I think it's one. <laughs> uh, I forgot what, I, oh, actually I can see what it is by, uh, setting this back to its default. Yeah, it's one. Okay. <laughs> I forgot what that was normally set at. So basically it, if you have it at one, it's trying to keep its normal, uh, you know, what the rest shape bends are. Uh, but if you drop this down to zero, you can, it, it basically tries to reduce all the bend angles to zero. And so it flattens out the geometry. This can be handy for stuff. Like if you have cloth geometry that's modeled in position, but you want to act a little bit more like natural cloth, um, you might want to get rid of that. Uh, you might want to reduce that rest angle down to zero. Um, so those are, I mean, the rest of this is pretty, pretty simple, except of course, the, the main thing that everyone, whoops, get a little ahead of ourselves there. Um, the main thing everyone runs into is you open up and you're like, oh, okay, bend stiffness one times, and then you get all these wacky values of like, you know, 0 0.00001 to like a billion. And you're left wondering like, well, what the heck? do I set this to? What is a reasonable range for this? And I mean, of course it varies because there's so many different factors. And so it's hard to recommend a specific range. So what you really need to do is just a uh, kind of trial and error of trying out different values, uh, you know, running the sim, seeing how it works, rewinding the sim, playing it again. It, but of course that would be insane. Like you're going to spend all day trying to figure out, you know, what the, the bend resistance should be. Uh, luckily we have a, a nice tool for that and it's kind of a, a built-in wedging tool and it's part of top nets. Um, so top nets are task operator networks, also known as PDG procedural dependency graph. And so what we want to do is this is a little bit, it feels a little unorthodox, but we can, what we do over here in bend, I think I need to set this to one and it can set a, make up a variable bend test. Now, what we're going to do is inside the top net. All right. So I actually just did this whole thing. I made the whole graph and then I realized, uh, the screen recorder wasn't working right. So. Hey, I'll just uh, do it again. Uh, okay, so we're in PDG here. Um, by default, the local scheduler will only take a fourth of your cores. You're probably want to uh, you'll want to use all of them except for one. Um, but since I'm also trying to do screen recording and other stuff, I'm just gonna keep it at one fourth. Um, so you drop down a wedge node. Since we're doing wedging, we want four wedges. Normally, you probably want to do nine or something, but. It's getting late and I'm tired and so I just want to do four. Okay. Uh, and then we tell the attribute name to be that same one that we made earlier. And we'll give it a set of ranges to try out. Uh, that, 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 there we go. Okay. Right click, generate node. There we go. Oh yeah. And I'm actually basically doing this, uh, this is a really good tutorial on PDG and it kind of uses, uses an effects workflow as a demo. Um, so this is what I'm going to do is just sort of a abridged version of this essentially. So find this and read this if you want to get more into it. Uh, PDG is really cool. So we've got our, our wedge setting there. Now we're going to make a ROP geometry output node. Um, so we're going to point it to the SOP path to the out cloth and output file. This is important. Um, see, by default, 
each wedge is going to overwrite the previous output file. So obviously we don't want that. So we're going to give it wedge index, and that's a variable that will, each one of these will be um, a different index. So zero, one, two, three. And those are, those are not, they're not single quotes. They're, these are the, uh, the backtick key next to number one. And, oh, and we'll set this to the whole frame range. And also on the ROP fetch, make sure since this is a simulation, um, each process has to run through the whole batch of frames. Um, you know, otherwise it approaches it like a render where it's just throwing cores at random frames. But since these are time-based, we need them in order. Uh, so generate that node. There we go. Okay, so if I run this right now, uh, it's going to write out these files, and that's pretty helpful. But what I'd really like to do is have it also flipbook them for me, because that would be even better. So we'll do a ROP fetch and a ROP net. Dive into the ROP net, drop in an OpenGL. We're just going to do a quick OpenGL, not like a real render. And, oh, I already have a camera in the scene. Yep, that'll work. Okay. Output, here we go again with the uh, wedge index. Let's see, whoops. Wedge index. Or get that. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Do JPEGs, I guess, save some space. Okay, so we get our OpenGL, then we have to point this to OpenGL node. Sorry, that was the ROP path that I just pushed it to. And for uh, frames and batching, let's do like 10 frames per batch. Generate the node, there we go. And what would be even better is if each of these flipbooks was labeled with uh, which bend attribute it's using or what, what the setting is currently at. Oh, and by the way, um, you can actually middle mouse click these guys. These are the wedge tasks and you can see that bend test is different for each one. Um, but basically we want that bend test variable to be displayed. So there's a handy node for that called overlay text. Super easy. Bend is bend test. There we go. Oh, and over here on ROP composite again. I have to do wedge index. Oh, and this is a fast process, so we're just gonna do all frames in one batch. Generate it. There we go. All right, so we're going to have all of our flipbooks um, labeled, and that's pretty helpful. It'd be great if we could put them in a mosaic, like tiled all in one image so we can look at them side by side. What we'll do that is, or for that, we'll do a partition by frame. And I think just the defaults will work on that. And then we'll do a ROP composite. and a composite network. And in here, we'll drop it a bunch of files. And for the file, you want it to be PDG result do zero. Make a couple copies of these. All right, this is probably a better way of doing this, but I'm just gonna do this manually. There, zero, one, two, and three. Interleave these together. And then mosaic. And for the mosaic, uh, do two images per line and four images per frame. Jump back out here. All right, now over here, we'll set the 
Ex use external cop and then cop path will point that to the mosaic. For here, now it's all, all four of them are in one frame, so we don't need to keep using the composite typing. So you have to keep using that wedge index and do a couple. We'll generate that. We'll... Okay, and so that's gonna make all the all the images all mosaiced out and everything, but they'll still be separate images. I'm gonna have it wait for all those images to get generated. So that'll be down to one task. And then we'll do a FFmpeg encode video. And this will be the video file it makes. Neat. And I'm sure all these weirdo settings here are all great. And if I just hit Shift G, this entire thing will run. And the computer will do all the work. And I can do something else for a couple minutes. Here we go. All right, so it is all done running. And so if we check our video directory, uh, made a video. Wow, that's some terrible lighting. <laughs> Man, that is not super helpful. I should have checked that in the beginning. Oh, whatever, whatever. Um, so you get the idea. You know, we get these labels of what the bend is at for each uh, each little video here. Okay, so in this case, you can see there's not a whole lot of difference between bend one and bend ten. Um, so you know, if I were to do this again, I'd probably wedge between zero and one and kind of fine-tune the settings from there. And also, just so you know, if you click on one of these tasks that outputs images, like the overlay text, and check the info on it, if you just click the uh, image file path, it'll open up the uh, images in mPlay also. All right, so there, there you have it. That's how you find the best settings and make sense of these insane values and find which values are actually reasonable, you know. So there you have it.